Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, thanks for the turnout. Um, looking quite a good number here. So I appreciate you uh, getting up early enough and, and joining us. This is the first uh, agents uh, forum meeting we're having in 2022. So, um, you know, special, uh, special welcome. Um, we have a busy agenda, but very useful, very interesting, I'm hoping. Um, so first thing will be uh, quick introductions. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Tumi Hawkins. I am the lead cabinet member for planning, policy and delivery at South Commission District Council. And with me is Katie Thumbra. Katie is my, well, say hello. Hello, I'm Katie Thombra. I'm the Executive Councillor for Planning Policy and Transport at Cambridge City Council. It's lovely to be here. Thank you, Katie. Uh, there's obviously quite uh, a number of um, officers with us. Um, we've got Stephen Kelly, who is Morning, everyone. the Director. We've got Heather Jones. Morning, everyone. And we've got Jane Green. Good morning, all. Jonathan Dixon. Thank you, everyone. Daniel Weaver. Um, where are you, Daniel? I'm right here. Morning. Oh, yeah. Right in the middle of my screen. <laughs> uh, Bonnie, Bonnie Quark. I'm not sure if I'm missing anybody else. Toby's here. Toby, hi, nice to see you. Okay, um, and what I do now is I'm, I'm gonna speak as little as possible because there's a lot of information to be, given, uh, to be shared this morning. So what I will do now is hand over to uh, Stephen Kelly who will be able to tell you about what's happening in the uh, shared planning service and update. And I think we've got about 15 minutes for all of that, Stephen, including you, questions. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to need all, all, all of it, but I'll do my best. Um, I've written to a number of you um, uh, in the last in the last week or so, but but obviously I think a number of you are aware that uh, uh, Sharon Brown, the Assistant Director for Delivery, uh, and um, Paul Frayner, who was the Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy, which included the, the policy um, team and um, the Built Natural Environment team, uh, have both um, at different stages over March have, have left the council. Um, uh, and um, faced, with, faced with their uh, departures, we've obviously taken an opportunity, or I've taken an opportunity uh, to start to talk to the staff about uh, what uh, is the right approach uh, going forward um, for the future, bearing in mind that uh, we started uh, with our current setup in 2018, um, uh, and um, it seemed uh, appropriate to just uh, take stock and consider what the best use of our um, uh, resource would be uh, going forwards. Um, so. Uh, what we have put in place, having spoken to a number of the uh, teams uh, and spoken to a number of um, uh, the uh, kind of team managers across the service uh, over the last uh, few weeks, um, I've uh, started to put in place some um, medium term interim arrangements, uh, reflecting the fact that um, uh, I think there are uh, some continued uh, areas of focus that we want to uh, make sure that we deliver on, not least uh, the local plan, but also uh, working with uh, the delivery team uh, on uh, issues to do with um, a backlog of applications that we have, uh, but also uh, the focus uh, that's still required on strategic sites uh, and some of the changes that we want to make uh, as we integrate the um, delivery process. Uh, more more fully with our technology and so on post post COVID, uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the transformation program that we have put in place uh, in a little while. Um, what I've therefore um, uh, 
put forward or what, what we are now working to is some slightly different arrangements in terms of um, staffing in those areas. Most uh, particularly um, Heather Jones, who said hello earlier on today, uh, who has been managing the 3C building control service, uh, will be stepping in uh, to um, the post uh, created by Sharon Brown's departure to provide uh, some kind of senior management oversight to the uh, service as a whole, uh, uh, but also particularly to support the delivery uh, teams, which is strategic sites, the planning application uh, teams, uh, and the technical support team uh, on the next phase of, of their journey of, uh, of, of change and evolution, um, which COVID accepting, which threw us several curveballs, as I'm sure it did at you, uh, we hope to um, uh, be making uh, meaningful progress on uh, or continued uh, progress on uh, through 2022. Uh, alongside um, uh, Heather in my management team uh, is someone called Stephen Windsor, who's been with us since uh, 2019. Um, but I expect Stephen to take a slightly uh, more significant role for all of those um, back office system issues that we've we've dispersed, but which nevertheless um, have important implications for you. So. We're looking to try and uh, consolidate our planning performance agreement and our um, uh, work around um, uh, systems to um, improve the pre-application services. So all of the kind of invoicing and all of the kind of um, organizational activities, but also, um, and it is an important conversation that we're gonna have to have going forwards through 2022, uh, starting to bring together thinking about the resources that we have available to us to deploy and indeed the resources that we need uh, and your programs and projects and priorities through 2022 um, so that we, we can kind of better mirror uh, what you say you're needing uh, and what we um, have recruited uh, and have available uh, for those for those projects. That's historically been done um, uh, in uh, within the teams, but I'm trying to centralise and create a much tighter system for that. Uh, and as a consequence, we're also really keen uh, to hear from you what your uh, clients' priorities are, what your project priorities are, so that we can start to track that on a singular uh, in a singular location. Um, and that will include also the work uh, around. Uh, the local plan, uh, the work that we're doing um, supporting the Greater Cambridge Partnership Programme, but also a number of infrastructure projects which uh, are both disruptive in terms of our resources, but also um, require significant levels of support at particular times through the year. So we'd, we're organising the back office uh, through Stephen, uh, and uh, you might start to see his name a bit more, uh, and um, with Heather uh, coming in to, to uh, look over the delivery uh, area that Sharon Brown historically did and to continue with the 3C building control service. Um, we hope to get some uh, integration issues in terms of our IT and so on, but also uh, continue to support the, the, the teams uh, in delivery. Many of you will be uh, aware that um, uh, having resolved that that position, uh, that Nigel Blaisby is uh, currently unwell. Uh, Nigel is the effectively the head of development management. That's not uh, strictly speaking what what um, uh, our role profiles describe, but effectively to you, he will be. Um, you, you'll know him as the head of development management. Um, Nigel's unfortunately unwell at this moment in time, uh, and as a consequence of that. Uh, we are just going through the process of looking to um, add uh, some capacity caused by Nigel's vacancy with potentially some interim um, arrangements for cover because Nigel's unfortunately going to be off for um, a little while. Uh, the, um, we're in the process of doing that. Heather and I are currently in the process of looking at, at CVs. Um, I'm indebted to um, Toby uh, for... Um, uh, heroically stepping uh, up to help uh, me and Heather with planning committees at this moment in time. We've got three committees in the next few weeks um, 
JDDC uh, and uh, City and uh, South Cam's planning committees, but also to support um, uh, the, across the team, uh, the work, not only that we're doing to uh, keep the wheels on the wagon and make continue to make decisions, uh, but also um, the work around the transformation programme that I'll talk about a little bit later. So um, we're also uh, looking to see um, whether or not we need any additional resource uh, across the service, recognising that we've got um, continued high volumes of applications coming in. Uh, and um, we have, in addition to Sharon and Paul having left, some of your teams uh, might have joined everyone last Friday to say goodbye from shared planning service uh, to um, uh, Lewis Tomlinson and Aaron Coe, who have uh, crossed the Rubicon and uh, are now working, um, uh, I think, for, uh, uh, for either themselves, in the case of, of Lewis as a consultant, uh, or um, Stratton Parker, I think, in the, in the case of, of, of Aaron Coe. And we, we wish them well, um, but we're obviously therefore in a circular process of looking to recruit uh, more people, and we've got some forthcoming interviews for uh, team leader roles, um, certainly. Um, Beverly, I think, has circulated some newcomers uh, who've joined the service. She circulated that uh, yesterday. And at a future um, meeting, we'll probably try and see if we can find a way of getting them to introduce themselves to you. Um, we will be updating the organ organogram, uh, the kind of structure chart, to help you to um, uh, navigate your way around the new names and contacts. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the slightly um, dis the disruptive nature of Nigel's unexpected absence means that uh, over uh, just the next couple of weeks, whilst we put interim arrangements in place, um, I just uh, request your at least understanding that we might not be able to be quite as uh, rapid in our in our responses. Some of you might raise a wry smile there, uh, but um, uh, we are uh, uh, we are working on. And providing an in, in improved um, uh, uh, or a, a response to, to, to that vacancy. Um, I think to me that's probably all I all I need to say uh, about that at, uh, at the moment. I will come on to talk about the transformation program in in, in a minute. But I just wonder whether there's any questions that uh, arise from that. Oh, actually, sorry, I should say that um, because I want to look at the the way that we're organised uh, and I want to work with the team about what the best uh, and indeed the most progressive structure is uh, for uh, their development as well as for the services development. Um, the arrangements that I've outlined will probably uh, be in place for up to 12 months uh, until we um, set out uh, our next uh, way of working, our next, our next structure. It's fair to say that we're also looking in terms of way of working uh, in both councils at the use of our existing uh, states. Um, I'm sure a number of you are doing exactly the same uh, and about the role of uh, the different offices uh, in our service offer going forwards, particularly in terms of uh, their capacity to support meetings face to face. Um, some of you will have already been to our uh, planning committee meetings um, held in the buildings, but um, uh, that's probably uh, Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that, Stephen. Um, I did put in the chat box to ask, say if anybody wanted to ask a question as we we're going along. Uh, if you just post stop in the chat to say speak, please, then I can call you because I've got two screens of people, <laughs> so I can't see everyone um, if you put your hand up. So just post in the um, chat box, speak, please. But right now, Stephen, there isn't any question, unless anybody has any questions right now. No, you might have later on. <laughs> Uh, speak now. Uh, who wants to speak? Can I just make a very brief comment? Yes, sure. Judith, yes. Yeah. Good morning. Um, what might seem very trivial after what Stephen's been talking about, but you're basically talking about organization. And there's this dramatic contrast between small, trivial applications and strategic site applications. And sometimes clients understand a strategic thing taking a long time, but it's very difficult if because of conservation zones, 
I mean, you need planning permission for garden sheds. Uh, I had a long hassle a couple of years ago over a bicycle stand uh, because of a conservation zone. Is there some way you could efficiently separate these tiny little ones that you know clients simply do not understand? You know why? Uh, I mean, we almost had a catastrophe on the bicycle shed uh, bicycle stand. Uh, which was absolutely trivial, and it went on and on and on, and it delayed uh, building where they had where it was for a church, and they had volunteer workers who they were going to lose because it didn't come through in time. And now I've got a client with a you know a bicycle sh uh, with a, a, a basically in a conservation zone, replacing an existing uh, shed with a tiny a slightly larger one and telling the client, well, it might take two months, it might take three months because they're backed up. Is there any way of you designating some sort of, let's just get this stuff out of the way, you know, have a, have a planner who, if it's small enough um, that it's just get it off the desk, don't take two months, you know, just push it away so that people don't feel that you know this is just bureaucracy gone mm. gone crazy you know why do you have to wait for a couple of months for for bloody gosh that under permitted development would be a, would be allowed Judy. Thanks, Judy. A conservation zone so you need you need to go through the whole planning application Judith, I'll, um, absolutely, we are looking. We're, we're, we're looking at that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing as part of the transformation because we are, um, we are certainly uh, exploring how we we might triage applications slightly differently um, mm -hmm. in order that um, getting rather than sequentially or on a time basis dealing with applications, we start to uh, take a, a much more. Um, uh, active role in managing those small cases that that can pass through the process without significant interference and those which are uh, justify uh, more, more effort but i'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a minute so i understand we understand the issue thank you okay um no one else has indicated to speak so perhaps uh, i'll hand back over to you then stephen um you. you have and actually I think you have merged items two and three. <laughs> yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. What, what I'll do then, and I'm going to, I'm not really a Zoom expert, but I'm going to try and share my screen uh, to share with you a, a PowerPoint presentation, just as a summary of the, of the transformation program. And, and hopefully I'll pick up on some of the themes that uh, Judith raises, because we are um, very much uh, looking to, um, uh, uh, to capture some of some of the concern that uh, you have raised, so let me just see if I can uh, do this. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Let me just uh, see if I can slideshow from beginning. Does that work for you? Uh, it does, we can see the slide and the notes section. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is this is my mastery of the... Um, so you're uh, in presentation the... mode, I think. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but that high presenter view. Does that make a difference? Now, now if you click the little uh, icon at the bottom right, to show go into presentation mode yeah and there yeah that one this is resume slideshow oh well we see the slides on the side but it's okay i think okay yeah just i'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go to because because my um yeah. my my personal development discussion is coming up shortly um with the two chief executives so please feel free to share your thoughts on that um, uh, and I'll go on. I'll go on the course. Um, but uh, some of you might have. Can you see the next slide? So yeah, we can. Extreme. Fantastic. Some of you might have um, uh, heard uh, that we uh, 
have engaged a firm called Mondrum, uh, who have done a, a number of uh, uh, support roles uh, with planning authorities in, in, um, uh, in the country. Uh, and um, we've been working with them for around uh, six months or so now, putting together a program uh, of uh, focused um, uh, and targeted interventions in order to try and um, resolve some of the challenges that we face with the um, uh, shared planning service and particularly with the um, delivery, uh, the development management uh, side of things. We obviously combined uh, the services and the technology um, seems a very long time ago now, um, at the start of 2020. Uh, that uh, process uh, created a little bit of a um, backlog for us because we, for the first time, pulled together essentially the backlogs in two systems. Uh, and um, we resulted in uh, uh, something that we headed into the um, COVID pandemic with around 1,500 uh, uh, cases that were um, substantially past sort of their six, uh, their eight week uh, timetable. Some of them around a thousand planning conditions, in fact, in that, in that figure. Uh, and uh, COVID didn't necessarily help us uh, massively. Uh, the backlog um, uh, got slightly worse, about 400 extra cases through that um, uh, 18 month period. Um, uh, and it inhibited our ability to both develop our systems uh, and our um, uh, and focus on our processes. And of course, the disruptive nature, which I'm sure you all faced of people being in the office, changes to planning committee arrangements uh, and um, uh, the ability to pull people together to uh, problem solve around some of our system and process issues uh, was compromised. So having heard all of the feedback um, that people um, were sharing with us uh, and working with Mondrum and with the team. Uh, we've come up with a series of focused um, pieces of work, uh, the, the heart of which, um, uh, as you can see from the headline on the screen, is around trying to reduce work in progress. What work in progress means is the um, uh, large number of non-strategic sites, um, planning applications that uh, the service uh, has. Um, I think I've said to a couple of you, over the last uh, two years or so, we tend to deal with about seven to 8,000 applications a year, not all of them planning applications, but a large number of things like conditions, uh, submissions. Uh, and um, that uh, quantum of work uh, has um, sits quite heavily in the service because the backlog itself creates a, uh, an additional burden on officer caseloads that has had a um, impact on both productivity, uh, picking up on uh, the points made around um, uh, the queue of applications before people get to your uh, specific one, um, but has also meant that uh, although um, we have a steady broadly steady state in terms of uh, resource, so the backlog isn't getting any worse. It's equally not, uh, until relatively recently, been getting substantially better. Uh, and um, that's created both the frustrations that I know happen to you, but also quite significant challenges in terms of workloads for individual officers and the amount that they're dealing with. So reducing, as we call it, the work in progress, the kind of officer caseloads, and getting more decisions out to the door than we receive is obviously a clear priority um, for that. Uh, and you can see from the list of work streams that we uh, are engaged with, working with Mondrum, uh, a number of the things that we're looking to try and simplify, to redefine, uh, and to um, uh, and to, to make progress on. The short interval management uh, is really an internal process, as it says, uh, around uh, helping the team leaders with the teams, picking up on um, at the point around, can we pull out some of those simple applications uh, with some of our less experienced staff and help them to kind of clear the decks sooner um, and with support from managers. Um, uh, we've talked about uh, work in progress. We have a couple of um, additional um, staff. We're working with Capita in providing a degree of uh, additional support to the team 
um, uh, through uh, case officers who, whose job it is to uh, try and chunk through some of those long-standing backlog cases and to remove them from the, from the system to bring down uh, that work in progress list, um, which is still quite, quite significant in terms of um, uh, cases that are uh, some, some months old. Uh, we've been doing some work and it. This is comes back to the point I've said about the uh, shared planning service structure that we're still looking at uh, around um, uh, agreeing the roles and responsibilities, agreeing who does what, uh, and importantly, as part of that, also looking to explore ways in which we can remove the burden from some of our team leaders and um, managers uh, by taking some of those uh, administrative tasks that local authorities um, uh, enjoyed, uh, I think it was uh, the term self-service uh, crept in, uh, enjoyed um, passing down to managers, but which when we have a real challenge, we all have a challenge of finding planning officer resource um, is a distraction from them, uh, uh, from the focus of uh, making decisions and supporting teams in making decisions. Um, we're, put a, we're putting together an updated service plan uh, that just seeks to kind of harden down on this uh, and the um, work uh, on the next pages, um, which, uh, which we want to get done in order to impact the work in progress, impact uh, the backlog. So you'll see that having rolled out uh, our previous uh, pre-application changes, um, we recognise that it's pretty clunky. We recognise that it's not necessarily um, fully targeted to the uh, and adding um, the value that it should be doing uh, to all of you. Um, and so we're looking at the um, uh, process to see whether or not we can offer some tweaks to it, um, both in terms of reducing the uh, delays and the inputs required. It's quite time consuming um, for us, and we know that's frustrating to you in terms of the delay, in terms of offering a response, but also to make the process simpler and um, more accessible uh, for you and your clients, particularly in the context of the slightly harder line we're taking around um, amendments of applications uh, and the need for us collectively um, to get it right. We are um, engaged in a significant uh, and ongoing review of the information that we have on our website uh, and um, how we can make it not mail this access easier uh, and more efficient. Um, uh, but also, importantly, trying to answer some of the questions that you or your clients may have before um, uh, to avoid you need, needing to um, uh, perhaps speak to officers, not because we don't want to speak to you, but because um, if we can answer your queries or your clients' queries as soon as they need them, um, rather than have to wait to phone us up or email us, um, then that, that seems to us to be both good for you and um, helpfully improving our efficiency. And there is something around, you might have seen some, I think we've made 28 changes in February, so a change a day to the website. Um, there is a wider piece about uh, how the shared planning service website um, evolves, um, but we are looking to try and answer your questions before, um, uh, before having to contact us. So please feed through to us if there are frustrations or irritations about our website and the information on it that you think would be really helpful um, for us to uh, change. Uh, and uh, we're trying to, uh, and you will see us start to increasingly push the use of the uh, consultee arrangements that exist in IDOCS. Uh, that's something both for our parish councils that we're looking to try to do but also something um, to try and help us to reduce the amount of paper consultation that we end up doing. Um, you may or may not be aware, but our public access system allows you as an agent to uh, put searches in place on any part of the district uh, and having saved that search to get automatic email notifications uh, of um, changes. Uh, and I believe if you're um, application itself, um, uh, if you start to track that, uh, it will also notify you when changes happen to that application through additional material being uploaded uh, and, and, and so on to the file. Um, and we're very keen to try and make more use and to help people to utilise that capability, both to track 
um, applications and we're going to be looking at how we can increase the uh, utility of the uh, different status provisions in applications, but also to try and, as I said, allow planning officers to focus on those things that, um, in some respects, um, you're able to do uh, yourself so that we can focus on planning decision making and reducing that uh, backlog. Um, uh, finally, we are doing uh, some system work with uh, IDOCs uh, to try and configure it more effectively. Uh, and we will, over the coming months, be reviewing the enforcement functions, the enforcement policies and our processes, uh, particularly to provide a consistency between both councils. So, for example, you can make an enforcement complaint in South Cams online, but you can't do it in Cambridge at the moment. Um, that will all be changing fairly shortly, uh, as will the way that we record, track and um, report uh, on those um, enforcement uh, uh, functions. So, um, so a range of um, actions in our transformation program, some of they're not really very sexy and exciting, but they are meaningful because we think they will allow us to knuckle down and focus on um, those things that are consistently frustrating to yourselves, but also really importantly, um, uh, are impacting adversely the workloads and the uh, capacity of our teams, recognising that we're not going to be able to magic up uh, lots more planning officers. I know that we're all uh, looking for that, um, uh, but we need to look uh, uh, at ways of making the best use of the teams that we've got and helping them and you uh, to stay sane. Uh, so um, thank you. I don't know whether there's any questions or any uh, comments that people wish to make? Uh, thanks for that um, comprehensive update, Stephen. Um, uh, yeah, no one's put anything in the chat yet to say they want to speak. Ah, I have just seen a hand up. Hi, hi, Jimmy, it's Garth Hanlon from Savills. Hi, hi, guys. Hi, hi, uh, morning. Um, Stephen, just on a couple of things. Um, obviously, um, well, first of all, I know people have best wishes to Nigel, more importantly than anything else. Um, mm. But se secondly, um, I mean, you're, you're referring obviously to resources and the issues you've got at, um, on your side. And one of the issues, uh, you comments you made um, when you first um, presenting to us this morning was about what clients' reactions are or have been. Um, there'd be a number of us I know have got major applications either in or pending. And I, I suspect one of the implications um, in the context of the, the issues you've got is that I think you'll understand that clients will want to perhaps move quicker because of the concerns they've got in terms of feedback timescales. And as a result of that is probably like, for example, pre-application submissions um, through the process, whilst there may have been say five or six or whatever it is, they may be condensed down to three. And the onus being on ourselves as consultants with clients, putting more information to yourselves and almost not running before we can walk, but the temptation is to try and get as much in through the process and reduce the amount of workloads as a result of it. So, you know, I, I just think it's, it's a, a comment which I think probably a lot of us would well hopefully agree with and for I think yourselves as officers to understand that's possibly the implications of some of the issues that you've got what we're having to do is move quicker perhaps um, to, to deal with that. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the things that we are going to be it, 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 it's a difficult thing to describe we are looking really carefully at the pre-app process because oh. I've been in, involved in a number of conversations uh, in the last uh, couple of months in which people have said uh, and indeed our ob my observation um, being drawn in um, both since and before Sharon has left into some of those pre-application um, discussions where there's a sense to which we haven't landed the plane effectively in terms of a definitive position uh, is um, how we might be more efficient in that uh, process. Um, so your, your comment that um, uh, we might be putting more in in sooner. I suppose my my sense is 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 that one of my observations, and it might just be an observation uh, based upon a, a very small number of cases, uh, is that um, 
we we perhaps are dancing round a little bit the the core elements of a scheme uh, uh, that go to the heart of how we move forwards. So that, for example, um, we can spend a huge amount of time uh, focusing, and I know that in some cases, you know, your clients will spend a huge amount of resource uh, on. Um, focusing on elements of detail, on, 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 on points of layout and, and, and design, for example, before we've resolved fully and absolutely the position on principles. Uh, and, uh, uh, and certainly in a couple of cases that I've spoken to um, uh, some local agents about recently, um, there is a kind of a sense that, um, well, we've had four meetings now and we've been discussing, we've got this beautifully rendered building and, and layout. Um, and yet we've still got questions about some of the principles that sit behind the development itself so that when it comes to the application comes to the planning application submission um, either our consultees or our stakeholders or policy team or the uh, conservation team and so on um, are perhaps not yet fully settled on a, on a, on a position uh, and so um, if I was kind of if I was characterising it, I think um, I'm certainly going to be encouraging my team to be more straight talking, if a little bit harder at the beginning, so that we're all clear exactly what it is that you and your clients need to focus on, uh, rather than perhaps at times give the impression that, um, yes, this big, really big elephant in the room over here, uh, we haven't worked an answer to, but let's talk about the elevations or let's talk about the landscaping and so on. I think we, you know, in, in my analysis, I'm very quick. They used to call it brass tacks, didn't they? I'm really keen to get to the um, real brass tacks of the scheme sooner, because what otherwise then happens is, uh, and I've noticed the application comes in and we're perhaps missing um, that uh, high level strategic kind of quite difficult conversation around the things that really are um, at the heart of the, of, the, of the consent. Now that's something that you know we want to work with our with our, our teams on to be a little bit more honest with you maybe um, rather than I've seen all sorts of very um, uh, gentle language um, but try and be a bit more honest about um, what we do and a little bit more directive if we can be in terms of how we think um, the solution to that um, might be resolved. Uh, because I think otherwise um, it takes us all a huge amount of time and becomes very frustrating to find these um, uh, unresolved issues at, at the application stage. So we're trying to improve the efficiency of the process, not just the process itself, if that's if that's helpful. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, I think you're, you're right. I don't there's any nothing you said that um, causes you know any surprises. This and I suspect what he, probably what I was saying about uh, is that maybe the the second and third pre-op rather than the first one might be the ones that is, is more condensed in terms of detail mm. rather than the first one. I, I accept, first 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 of all, you know the first pre-ops oh, dare I say sometimes the most important one, which is principle. So I haven't. It's not that one. It's almost the the more advanced ones. Perhaps maybe well. May, may need to be condensed once we've got the big strategic issues out of the way of principle. So just more of the comment than anything else, but I think it's just an appreciation perhaps of from your side that that might be the implications um, later in the process rather than the start. The, the important point on, on, on that, Garth, is, is uh, and, uh, and that's understood, obviously, um, uh, we're going to talk about the, the, the design review process that we yeah. we revisited for um, the whole of Greater Cambridge now, so um, integrating that in a, in a little while. Um, but but I but I do think that uh, sometimes you know if, if for that process to be effective, what I would say is that um, uh, it's not that nobody's got an open mind in pre-app. But my experience sometimes is that the kind of design team become incredibly invested in a solution, perhaps even before we've had the principles conversation. Uh, and, and it then becomes hard for us and for yourselves, I'm sure at times, and the client to um, to reverse out oh. of the situation or to resolve something. And, and, and I'm very keen that perhaps you, there is less design up front and more conversation about the principles so that um, we, set the, we set the course fair in terms of what needs to happen. I'm sure my team, um, and I've certainly seen it, get some very, expensive and very fully rendered proposals now we've we we have in the past perhaps asked for some 
greater levels of detail around some of that um, very early in the process, which, which I'm sure your clients are invested heavily in and which then become quite a challenge in terms of sunk cost, in terms of um, uh, starting again or, 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 or looking at more broadly. So I think that first uh, meeting becomes incredibly important uh, and you know some uh, comments from some of you I've had in the past is you know you, you almost ask for too much information at the first meeting so that that everybody is too far down the pathway of a scheme or a project and so on before you get to the before we get to um, then discuss kind of key elements of principle um, so we'll be looking at we'll be looking at that um, recognizing the cost and efficiency issues that you've highlighted okay uh, thanks for that Stephen there's um sorry i need to reiterate please please put speak please in the chat because when all the hands are up i can't i don't know which order it is in um katie's hand i saw first and then i will call colin uh colin brown after katie please thanks yes thank you um Garth, i was just one of the things um i i uh i agree with everything stephen's saying and we're fully backing him and the team but another area we want to um work on is reducing conditions the number of conditions and working with consultees regarding comments i think uh the 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 conditions need to be one of for me it, reducing those applications and household applications so and that we that, lost you a bit there Katie. Oh, oh sorry it's i was just saying as one of my priorities is reducing conditions getting the right conditions for mm -hmm. the scale of um application and and i feel in some cases it we i would want to be working with applicants about a slightly higher level of information submitted even if it's uh but uh as long as it's not onerous so that um things can be agreed in advance i would i think that would be something that we'd all benefit from yeah that's uh, definitely a good point um i'm trying to keep an eye on the time if uh colin brown please yeah to me thanks very much i'll be um quick um I, I mean i agree with everything that's been said in the previous exchange and and, and also katie's comment just now about um conditions and I think it is incumbent on us all to try and ensure that we do provide as much information with applications as we can to try and minimize the amount of conditions that the authority needs to put on. The, the, the one point I just wanted to make was apropos the matter of establishing the principle and I, and I agree that th that is good practice to do that right from the very outset. Um, without going into specifics over we have had a number of cases where that on the RAG system, you know, we found that the principle of development has remained amber, probably three, if not four meetings into the process, when <clears throat> I think we're all pretty clear that the principle of the land use is acceptable. But what we found quite often is that the officers are saying, well, we can't really give you a definitive view on that until some of the, some of the detail that sits behind the proposal is actually known. And I'm not sure that's altogether helpful I think, as Stephen said earlier on, if we can just clear that out of the way right at the very beginning, I think we all understand there's a hell of a lot more work still to be done, but I think it would be beneficial just to clear that early doors. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Colin. Um, Jenny, Paige, please. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I'd echo Garth and Colin's comments and certainly say um, an honest conversation early on is really handy for um, us to go back to speak to clients. Uh, certainly, you know, it sort of sets the scene about where we've got to work for and I think it helps all round. It, it does come back to also, and I think uh, another point that again helps us all round, um, including your officers, is communication. Um, mm -hmm. and also giving um so firstly just giving us a time that you can come back to us um and sticking with it because again we're off your back then um we can tell clients um it's going to be three weeks it's going to be four weeks and i think that that certainly helps mm -hmm. the process as well um a couple of other things so shout at me if i'm going on too long um one is i think about 
going forward with any new applications and pre-app, we can give clients the head up, heads up that it is going to take um, longer um, and certainly give them a matter of months. The hard thing is often the um, pre-apps and the applications and the discharge of conditions that we, really, we have in at the moment um, where we're needing to update clients on existing um, projects. Mm -hmm. So dealing with a backlog is um, a really useful um, um, point for us to again, deal with clients where we've got existing projects in. Um, and a couple of other things was, um, be interesting to hear your view on deemed consents for conditions. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're seeing that more um, and whether that actually is a positive or negative for you in dealing with those applications. Um, one other thing, I'll whiz through all of these and obviously come back to me offline if, if, if it helps, was about speaking to your consultees direct rather than going via um, um, the planning officer. Um, that might, um, again, save time all around, particularly if it's very specific, say a question on um, ecology. We may be able to solve that ourselves between our consultants mm. and them. Um, without compromising anything to do with the planning applications. Um, and one, one other thing was about um, a practicality on submitting pre-apps. I don't think you've got all your specialised services up there for us to request, for example, such as heritage, um, which makes it difficult. Um, I've ended up putting it in your and any other comments bit, which... Um, <laughs> probably complicates things but um, just I think easier for you for example in invoicing as well um, and then one other thing is Last about, thing. <laughs> final thing sorry <laughs> is, is just about um, your um, say parish councils or people who are putting in um, comments um, and whether they are fully aware of the difficulties and the challenges you've got at the moment and I have every sympathy for you being a planning officer in the past, although I don't have an inkling of your challenges now, I, I think I hope I have some idea and um, hope that things improve for you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Jenny. Um, just to comment on the last one. Um, many of my myself and my colleagues actually attend parish council meetings, their monthly meetings or two monthly meetings, and we do tell them. Um, you know, some of the challenges we do have. So yes, we, we try to educate them so they know what's, <laughs> what's going on. Um, but I think also they are afraid potentially sometimes to talk to, uh, I guess, you know, people like yourselves who bring um, projects to them. They're going, if they talk to you, then they might be seen to be agreeing with what you're saying. So there's, um, yeah, I guess there's communications to, uh, to um, work out on that one. Um, I'm looking at the time thinking uh, there's no, oh, Judith, can you be quick? And then we can go on to yeah. this. We still have time for questions at the end. Oh, very quick. Just the, the idea of the principle separating detail and principle. I think the problem that Stephen's obviously you know, completely aware of is that you can establish something in principle, say that mm -hmm. there should be development on a site and there should be flats. And then it comes down, in fact, to the detail of, say, with flats, is it livable? Do they satisfy uh, minimum room requirements, you know, size requirements uh, on houses? So there's, um, I think it's in principle lovely to say that you'll give, you know, establish the principle first and then go into the detail. But sometimes the principle falls down on the detail. And so it, in a sense, I think it might be more difficult to do that separation. I think we understand that, Judith. But, but you know, some of my experience, for example, though, is, is, is that um, when I talk about the principles, it's things like, what's the, what, what are the, what's the building envelope capability? If it's 10 stories high and in, in a two-story conservation area, you know, is that, actually something that we're working through before we've designed the windows and the reveals uh, and 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 uh, or what are the trip rates associated with this development and are they capable of being accommodated at that quantum of floor space for example before we get into the landscaping details and, and so on that we tend to sometimes run in parallel 
Uh, and then what happens at the planning application stage is those issues come back and bite everyone when everybody's thought they've had four pre-apps or they've had five pre-apps and the matters are resolved. But um, we absolutely understand that it's not, uh, uh, you know, um, there aren't hard lines here, but I'm very keen that we kind of get to the nub of the application um, perhaps and, and, and a really clear if we don't think we've resolved that um, uh, earlier up into the process, picking up on Colin's point around things staying uh, amber, we perhaps need to just make sure that we're clear on what amber means uh, or what red means or what green means. But um, uh, no, helpful, helpful comments. Thank you. Well, can I just okay. back on that? I mean, uh, in the past, there have been a situation where uh, many years ago, when I was applying for things, it was passed, even though in a sense, in principle, it wouldn't have been, and I was asked to help you rewrite your design guides. That was, you know, years ago on, on loft conversions. So having a detail, a principle uh, overriding without the details may actually destroy an application that would otherwise pass on the basis of the details. In other words, if it's, if it's a well enough thought through design, it may, you know, you may reconsider and say, ah, yes, in general, we wouldn't go for this, but this is so interesting and so well developed. I mean, that, you know, goes back. So it, it, it's a bit difficult to separate them entirely, I think. I think that's understood. We're, we obviously yeah. need a complex process. I was trying to be kind of covering a, 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 a observations um, uh, from from my own perspective, but I appreciate that um, uh, every every case is distinctive. I'm just keen that we get to, we get to the to the nub and, and your comments. Um, you know, if you want to put comments into us around that, please feel free to to to, to do so. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think I've got Jane on next, but just very quickly, uh, there was a comment from Kenman Architects in the chat, which says, is there a way in which we, the agent, can contribute through peer reviews using local architects as a resource? You might want to think about that, Stephen. OK, uh, Jane, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. And hopefully, can you? I, I can't see anything now on my screen. Can you see the slideshow? Yes, I can. Um, but I, I can see it in the same view that I probably had it. Yes, <laughs> I probably need to go on the same training course as you, uh, Stephen. Well, actually, hold on. perhaps I can do this one. Does that work it? Right. OK, let's see. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, before oh. you go ahead. Uh, sorry, yeah. Beverly, for some reason, the chat is disabled. Oh, OK. It happens, me... I think, when you're presenting um, to me, maybe. No, it was on when you were presenting. Let, let me look into it. Okay. Okay, okay I'll keep going. You keep um, going, Jane. So thank you very much. So I really want to just talk to you a little bit about design review, about some of the changes that we've been making. Um, and obviously, can, can we continue to encourage you to use the service? As Stephen says, we've obviously been going through a number of changes and improving our processes. A lot of it's about aligning the processes that we've got. Um, and again, I suppose following on from that conversation we've just been having about working closely with the planners. So part of the process has also been us working with our planning colleagues so they actually understand the benefits of design review and they use it appropriately. So they use it quite an early stage, but they actually are using it as part of the process they fully understand. Um, so we've got um, just a, I'm sure most of you here know what design review is, um, but for those of that you don't, um, it's, it's a really important part of the pre-app process um, and it's seen as very much a, a critical friend to all parties, both the planning authority, future decision makers, but also yourselves as agents and hopefully your clients as well. Um, based on some very established principles, 10 key principles of design review, um, and some clear benefits, benefits to the process that we know we need to improve and will continue to want to improve, but also to the outcomes as well um, on the ground for both our, our businesses and our communities. Um, the review that we've undertaken over the last 12 months, and some of you will have been involved in that and answered questions and some of the questionnaires in the early stages, so thank you very much for that. 
um, really helpful that's informed um, the changes that we've made. We previously had three panels in the area. We have the quality panel, which still exists, and that will always be there at the moment. That is looking at the strategic sites. Um, but we also have the two panels, one for Cambridge City, which was the design and conservation panel, and the other for the uh, South Cams, which is design enabling panel. Both run both had similar prints, similar objectives, but running very different ways. And what we've looked at that looked at is the best of those, but also looking at new practice um, and come up with a single panel going forward. Um, so the new the new uh, panel, which started in January, um, is a single uh, review panel. It's now um, pay to use, which South Cams was and the city wasn't. Um, so it's covering costs. We've got a new pool of panel members. Um, we have 40 uh, panel members, two new chairs. Um, and uh, generally aligning with the quality uh, charter. So we're going to use the four C's in a very similar format to the quality charter. So four, sorry, three different types of review, a full review, encouraging this very early on with yourselves, but also with the planners present as well. Um, a subsequent review, um, and then if need be a, a, a desktop review um, by the chair, that's really if, if there are things, a few final things that really need to be resolved before the application actually comes in to us. Um, we're currently carrying on reviews, obviously with COVID, etc. We're still doing those online and envisage doing that until the summer. We are, are lined up to do two reviews, uh, to have two panels a month if needed to actually keep the momentum going. Um, we've got Bonnie Kwok with us today, who's one of our panel members, managers, and the other one is Joanne Preston, who oversaw the review. Um, there's clear guidance on our website about what we would like yourselves as applicants to submit, um, and also for the case officers as well. Um, and the criteria, so this, the, these are um, in very broad terms, the criteria of so what we would encourage you to bring to panel, so based on the size and the scale of them, but also the sensitivity, because we're very aware that um, schemes can be very different and what can be large um, in one part of the district may, may be quite small in others, etc., or vice versa. As I said, we, we, the panel will be focused on the four C. So this is how we'll ask you to present your scheme to make sure that you've given consideration to all these various aspects, the three four aspects of the scheme and the panel reports that will come back will be on that basis as well. Um, you'll get a report from the panel chair within 10 days. It will be based on those four C's. Um, that, report, that letter stays confidential to yourself um, and ourselves until the actual application comes in. And once it comes in, then it will actually go on our website and actually will support your application going through to planning committee or to the decision makers. Um, again, this was something that we did in, er erratically before. So we will now be monitoring. So after every panel, you will actually be able to send a questionnaire and you'll be asked for feedback on your experience with us. We also intend to have a, an advisory board that sits above it, effectively overseeing the work of the panel. And they will meet at least on an annual basis. There will be an annual report coming out based on that feedback, looking at lessons learned, keeping an eye to best practice and things that are happening around the country. Um, and that annual report will also be on the website. And then a final slide, which is just to let you know um, what's on our website. Um, and then join your attention in particular to we put a quick guide for applicants on the website as well. So draw that into your attention in particular. And that's me in terms of happy to answer any questions. And we've got Bonnie here as well. Thanks very much, Jane. Um, does anyone have any questions or shall we move on? <laughs> Uh, yep. Uh, th thanks, Jane. Um, one of the things I think would be helpful, just a quick commentary on when these design panels take place, as in pre-application and post-application. I still got sort of quite confused, despite being here for hundreds of years, of, <laughs> of when the best time to do them. I know you're going to say, you know, at the start, and then once the application is submitted, do you do it again? And I know that they become a as part of the committee item anyway um the, the feedback but i i'm always sort of if you can give us a bit of guidance yeah. on that that'll be we, helpful we would like you to come at the pre-app process we would like you we don't really want you to go when you when you've got your applications in that's far too late so what we would like you to do is build it into your pre-app process and your timeline then and we'd like you to build it in twice so actually going at a reasonably early stage once we've got that principle established with the planners but still early enough that it actually makes a difference and then 
if I'm honest, it depends on the nature of your comments you're getting. If you're getting a panel report that has quite a lot of issues that still need to be going to be addressed, it needs to go back a second time. By going back a second time, that demonstrates to the panel that you've actually dealt with everything. And then it gives confidence to the planning committee, because otherwise what was happening before is the planning committee were getting the report when it went first time with lots and lots of loose ends. And then they were having to work out whether those loose ends have been dealt with. The planner has to explain what has or hasn't happened. So our intention is to ask you to go twice once reasonably early once you've got your principles established and once once you've made those improvements unless it's perfect at the beginning but you know once you've made those improvements so there is actually almost a final report that goes so actually when you come in you've actually got that clarity and you know the mm. planner's got that clarity the community's got that clarity um and and the planning committee then has that clarity and you've obviously got hopefully that the support of the uh, panel and again having across all four um characteristics of quality you know it's clear across across the piece um but we can help you. So what should be happening is the planner should be working with you. What I hope would happen is to almost like work out a timeline for your for your yeah. pre-app and then fitting it into that. Yeah. OK, I, I suppose the, the, the um, an odd situation, perhaps thinking theoretical, if for whatever reasons nobody went to the design panel, application comes in. Do you consult the design panel anyway as a matter of course? No, right. but what okay. the planning committee might say is that actually this should have gone to panel. I, 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 that's actually what I, might well yeah. be because actually the other thing that we've been doing as part of this new process is doing a lot of work and training with the planners so they understand what design review and the benefits of it. And we've always also been doing that with planning committee. So yeah. actually what you'll see is that everybody becomes a design champion and actually it's a similar issues all the way through <laughs> for similar questions. Um, mm. And I'm Thank going you to answer yeah. Colin's yeah. question, which is in the chat I've just seen as well, which is yeah. what goes to quality panel and what goes to the um, yeah. Greater Cambridge. So yeah. Quality panel is basically dealing with the strategic sites. It's a county-wide panel, so it deals with those strategic sites. So it's about the geography, really. Um, so your water beaches, your North Stows, your urban extensions, but everything else will come to the Greater Cambridge panel. Um, I think last year, between the two panels, they considered about 40 to 50 schemes. So quite busy in terms of design review. Yeah. Um, and that's why we've set it up in a, such a way with a large number of panel members and a um, the opportunity to happen twice a month so we can actually keep up the momentum. Um, so Bonnie wants to add anything, we've got Bonnie on the chat as well. Do you want to add anything, Bonnie? You're still on mute, oh, okay. No, not really. Um, but I noticed that there are two questions uh, from Colin and from another agent. So Jane, would you like to answer them? I think okay. the first one has been answered, which is when does it go to the design review panel and when does it go to the county panel? Is that the first yeah, one? Just, is that okay, Colin? Was that clear what I said on that? It was entirely uh, clear, Jane. Thank you. Very clear. Yeah, I can see it. Thank you. In the That's cool. What about the second one? How is the design review panel process intended to mesh with any other public consultation, which may be required, or does it replace it? Uh, no, it doesn't. It certainly it. doesn't replace it. No. It's, 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 it's basically another tool that sits hand in hand in hand with, with yeah. the, the process. So again, we'll work with you in that, uh, that early meeting that we have, the first pre-app meeting that we have with you, we would be sitting down and talking through what, you know, identifying what the issues are that need to be dealt with. And obviously as, as part of that, we would actually map out with you um, when design review happens. Um, so it sits alongside other processes. It doesn't replace the conversations you'll have with the community as well, because um, that's really important. But you know, the panel is independent of the council. Mm. It's advisory, but it is independent. So you still need to be talking to the communities or whatever the issues are that come up at your pre-app stage. And if I might add to that, uh, looking at it from the viewpoint of a parish councillor and uh, a district councillor who represents many parishes and a member of the planning committee. <laughs> That's right. So I'm wearing those three hats and I'll speak to you. It is important um, that your proposal, actually that you discuss it with the parish council in the uh, village or wherever it is that um, you know, your proposal uh, will be affecting because the, what's been happening is they don't know about this until it becomes an application which they then get consultation on. Whereas if you spoke to them early, whilst you are putting things together, and especially those who have village design guides, right? You need to be able to speak to them, understand what it is that you know, the issues are for them and take account of that. Because when you come to planning committee, I can assure you, you will be asked that question. 
if I'm there, I will ask you. <laughs> and many, many of the planning council members are doing that now. We realize it's important to have good design. And it's important also that you go once the first time. And when you've heard from the uh, um, design uh, panel, you actually take into account what has been said and then make sure that is because I, I have in the last two planning meetings, I've been to actually ask if they've been to the design panel and if they went once, but then they go the second time. So it's important that the, the, the whole process actually is seen uh, to be done properly so that people are, those who have to take the new development are perhaps not as anti as they will be otherwise. That's the, that's the thing. And I'm talking from the viewpoint of somebody who represents the community here. Um, are we going to share the, this, the um, presentations? Yeah, yeah I think so. To. Okay. To All right. They, they will be shared. Thank you. Any further questions? I think we are yeah, just about on time with this one. <laughs> um, okay. Um, right. We're now on item six. So uh, we'll hand over to Stephen to talk about planning outputs. Thank you to me and I'll be very brief actually. Um, uh, I don't need 10 minutes on this and I'm sure you're interested in what's happening with the local plan from John. Uh, I wanted to just uh, highlight that over the next, um, uh, some, some uh, had an interesting conversation with Colin Brown on the call uh, last autumn, I think it was, crikey, uh, or maybe uh, early this year, just about um, uh, trying to share some of the information about where the service is at and uh, the numbers, what our performance is, uh, and, and so on. So over the next few weeks, um, we, we've certainly been doing a lot of work looking at data. Uh, everyone's looking at data these days, but we're doing a lot of work looking at data uh, and um, not only our own performance, um, uh, but, but actually your performance as well in terms of things like the applications that were valid when they were submitted um, uh, and um, uh, the uh, performance of uh, planning decisions, you know, our committee's performance, which uh, how many applications are overturned, what the percentages are, um, uh, with the intention of uh, trying to share with you some of the kind of key headline figures and, and, and so on, um, partly to help you to help understand where we are, um, if that sounds uh, right, uh, in, in terms of the number of applications we currently have on hand and, and things like that, but also our performance each month on validation uh, and um, uh, the kind of turnaround times. Uh, but, but with the intention of trying to help you to understand and help your clients to understand the position of the planning service, not just through the headlines of a kind of quarterly report on planning performance of decisions in time, but actually um, uh, a little bit more live data around um, where we are in terms of you know, validation times, uh, where we are in terms of uh, decision throughput times and so on. Um, and if there's something that's particularly of interest to you, uh, then if you could perhaps let me or a reference Stephen Windsor earlier, but he's not on the call, um, let me or Stephen know, um, then we're very keen to try and start to think about putting some uh, information together uh, for you in a relatively simple format that uh, just gives you a bit of an insight um, as, as to where we are. So with that uh, uh, to me, and as, and as I said, we may well come uh, and start talking to you about your performance on invalid applications because um, the figures go from 45% uh, for some uh, um, uh, named consultancies to um, 95% uh, uh, for others. Uh, so we have your performance. Um, we're not going to share it at this moment in time, but we do have your performance. And we're really keen to use that to try and understand what we can both do so that everybody gets 100% validation, so that everybody um, actually doesn't get uh, frustrated about that, that kind of process, um, which is not bad, not good for us, it's not bad, good for you, and it's certainly not good for your, for your clients. But, we, but please let us know if there's something that you would be interested in in terms of throughput numbers, either in the chat or by writing to me. So I'll move on um, to me to John, who's got far more interesting uh, conversation about the local plan. Thank you. Stephen, I'm going to start by building on the point um, you just raised. Um, so I think in a question received by email was, when are we going to publish the reps? We are actually still processing the reps. Um, you'll appreciate we have to do that alongside all the other work 
the team is doing, um, which I'll come on to a bit um, to cover. But just picking up on what Stephen said, um, unfortunately for us, when we're processing reps, it's the sort of minority of the reps that take all the time. So whilst I know an awful lot of people on this call use our online systems and put their reps in with summaries and all those things we would expect, but we still do receive reps which come in, you know, the worst cases are sort of scanned PDFs, so you can't even select the text. And okay. um, we receive maps where we have to, you know, digitize the maps somehow from fairly poor um, copies and so on. So I'm not necessarily naming names in this call at all. But um, what we do need help with is if my colleagues uh, contact you asking for different formats or Word versions and so on, um, I'd be really grateful if you could, could help them out if they come to you individually. Just help us speed that along. And we will get the reps published um, as soon as possible. It'll probably be in the summer, I suspect. Um, alongside that, we're already underway doing a lot of the work we said we were going to do. So for those, Hardcore local planners will have read all the topic papers we published um, back in November. We set out quite a number of areas where we'd carry on uh, developing the evidence, um, turning our policy um, ideas into actual policies and so on. So we are uh, working through commissioning evidence, doing our project planning on the moment that, on those issues. And the other thing we'll be doing is we've had a lot of comments on um, not just the sites we proposed, but as you will, many on the call will know, on sites that we didn't put in the first proposals, um, raise, raising comments on the level of need and the uh, individual issues around sites. We'll be going through um, all those issues and comments you've given us as you'd expect. Um, we have also received some new sites and a fair number of amendments to sites um, put in using our call for sites process. So, working through those as well. So you guys have given us a lot of work to do, but we are uh, ploughing on with it. Um, alongside that other work the team's been working on, um, we've adopted the biodiversity SPD, which you're going to hear about uh, in a bit. Um, in terms of neighbourhood plans, the Water Beach neighbourhood plan has now been uh, adopted. And we've got uh, several more, I think Fulbourne, West Wickham, Gambling Gay, all going through their examination stages. So we're getting to a stage where we'll be adopting, you know, almost doubling our number of neighbour plans fairly quickly in the next basically a few months, hopefully. Um, you'll have seen we published uh, the annual monitoring report, and alongside that, we published a new document um, providing a bit more detail and, and accessibility to our Section 106 statement. So we have to publish um, very sort of numbers, formal based data to meet our government requirements, but we've put that together with a covering document now to set out, you know, some of the things development actually helps deliver on the ground, the improvements it can help secure to give a, a broader picture of what, what your developments actually do for communities. Um, we're also uh, just about, we have published, it's currently going through its calling process at South CAMS, um, the uh, updated housing trajectory five-year land supply position, and uh, that shows that we've um, continued to maintain our five year supply this year being 6.5 years. Once again, thanks to um, everybody. And I know an awful lot of people on this call helped provide the information to do that. We put an awful lot of effort and detail into the five year statement, but we couldn't do it without you. So my thanks for your help with helping uh, Jenny and Mark are probably be on the phone to many of you in the last few weeks chasing, but it's been really good. Um, I think that's my general update covered. So there's an awful lot going on uh, behind the scenes, really, on the local plan, dealing with the information you've given us. John, can you just Thank say you. When, uh, when we're likely to be publishing the data um, from the consultation um, feedback? I think I think our ambition is early summer, isn't it? Yeah, but, that's right. Um, so we just see. We're just lining up the uh, suitable meeting dates. We'll probably take an update report to um, Katie and Toomey's relevant meetings uh, when we publish information. And we'll also accompany that with a summary report. You'll recall um, we included a sort of overview of this, the information we received and the summaries. We'll be putting that out there as well. So, yes, it's I don't have the dates uh, specifically um, and yet, but it will be hopefully early summer. 
Well, that's cool. Thanks. There's a lot of work still for you to do before then. So wish you um, good luck with that. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, I just had a question saying, what's the timing for the next public consultation of the local plan? Well, so we are still looking at the specific dates for that and we'll provide an update in the summer. But yes, we're still moving forward with all the work towards that. There is a lot to do. But we will provide yeah. an update. Okay, it's it's pro it's probably just worth adding, um, uh, and the reason um, uh, we're a little bit vague is is obviously uh, and picking up on Paul's uh, point around the program for local plan review. Clearly, there are some uh, some components outside of our control at this moment in time that determine uh, the uh, when we can reach uh, Reg nineteen status in terms of the level of certainty on a draft plan. Uh, and um, uh, including some of the infrastructure projects, but also clarification on water, particularly given the circumstances that Greater Cambridge finds itself in. Um, uh, and we're just trying to work with those kind of key agencies to understand when they will be in a position uh, that we can rely upon their uh, programmes or their publications and so on in order to be able to, to help us on that. Um, uh, I think um, we're also conscious that uh, the North East Cambridge um, site allocation is contingent upon the development consent order process for uh, the water treatment works. Uh, and um, uh, obviously that program uh, and the certainty that's necessary for an allocation uh, and the provisions that we've made for North East Cambridge uh, is linked to uh, our local plan timeline, uh, because clearly we can't put something forward um, for the next stage of the plan that would not be consistent with um, uh, the principles uh, of delivery and soundness and so on that underpin that. So, um, so we're still we're still working on that with with key stakeholders, trying to think about where East West Rail, for example, and that program sits now, where um, uh, the water treatment works program sits and as I said uh, how we can resolve the position in terms of uh, water particularly uh, with the right level of certainty uh, enabling us to get to go forwards but as soon as we as soon as we've got a, a, a picture around that we will um, we're likely to share more information about the program uh, in the summer after the uh, councils come back uh, following the local government election period so as John said watch watch this space uh, <clears throat> thanks, Stephen. I think that also potentially answers the question from Paul about confirming the program for the yeah uh, local plan review. Um, yeah, it was a good thing to be able to adopt another neighbourhood plan at a full council meeting last week, and uh, many many of our South Cam's um, communities are actually doing um, doing neighbourhood plans now. So. Um, do take note. Okay, um, we've got Charlene Harper, who will now talk to us about the TSO team. Thank you. Hi, Charlene, good to see Hello. you. Yeah, sorry about this morning, I was a bit late in. That's okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, right, I'm just gonna share my screen, so I've got a few facts and figures about what uh, my team uh, had achieved last year, really, so bear with me while I just do that. Uh, There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that okay. Um, okay, so I just thought it'd be really useful to oh, go back, there we go, uh, share some figures about what we actually achieved uh, last year. So um, obviously, we received a lot of applications last year. So, in total, including trees, there's 8,289 applications. Now, my graph here is showing what in blue, what was last year broken down into their very basic application types. And then the orange is currently what we've received so far this year. As you can see, um, we have received quite a few applications already this year. So um, numbers are 
still considerably high coming in on a regular basis for us. Um, we did receive 86% of our applications were received by the planning portal last year, which is brilliant, it does make um, my team's life a little bit easier in processing when all the information comes through, we're able to put that straight in. 12% we got via email and there was just 1% via post. So really a big thank you for everyone that's using the portal, it does make uh, life a lot easier for the, the starting process of validating an application. Uh, moving on, uh, looking at how many applications we actually validated that were invalid and withdrawn or closed. Um, so again, massive amount of applications that were validated and actually uh, went through um, to uh, validation stage and on to our case officers. Um, I haven't included trees in uh, this side um, because it's just easier to separate them out um, into uh, valid situations. Uh, number of invalid letters that uh, we actually sent out and uh, the number of closed applications. Obviously with invalid letters, there is a majority of applications that have invalid letters sent out that turn into valid applications. Um, but it just highlights that the importance and goes back to what Stephen was saying uh, earlier about trying to get that application right first time because the amount of work that goes in with the invalid uh, side to try and get it through to get it right for you uh, or for the um, applicant and getting it through um, uh, makes a big difference for us and again just showing where we are uh, this year and um, what we've achieved so far considering we're only three months into the year seems to have run away really quickly. Um, some of the invalid reasons that um, I thought I'd share is sometimes it's description, incorrect plans, and it runs through right to incorrect fees. Now, I've not separated out who has an agent, who doesn't have an agent, so it is just a whole mix of the invalid reasons that we have to deal with. Moving on, um, comments and our mailboxes. We obviously receive a lot of comments um, in uh, two different forms, consultee comments and third party comments. Um, so each comment has to be dealt with. So consultee comments, um, by the way the system is set up, we need to go in and physically name every consultee comment. So we're dealing uh, with that aspect of uh, having to go in and physically touch every single consultee comment to name them to make sure that it is visible on public access on who made that comment. Third party comments take us a bit longer as these are public comments. So every single one of them comments requires us to read through, redact any personal information um, and process it to make sure that it is suitable for our website without any data protection breaches. They obviously take a lot longer, um, but as you can see last year, there was nine, just over 19,000 comments that one of my team members varying team members would have gone in and touched last year. So it's a huge amount of time involved in processing them. Our mailboxes, um, I deal with several different mailboxes. So we have the comments one. So if the comment is submitted um, not by public access, it comes through uh, via email. Our land charges mailbox, um, our appeals mailbox, and our main mailbox, which is our planning inbox. Um, as you can see, that's over uh, 16,000 emails to deal with. Um, that mailbox does actually receive a considerably large amount of, uh, more because we receive all our um, portal information comes through there. So I have minus all of that off. So this 16,000, again, is something that a team member would have looked at over the year. Um, so I think it averages out um, about 65 emails per working day that we receive. So it's quite a lot of emails to try and keep on top of, deal with and uh, process. Um, appeals, um, last year we had not quite 120 appeals received um, and uh, we were just shy of the 100 mark um, in determining. Again, this year we're on a, 
a, a steady trend for matching the uh, number of appeals that we've received and determined. Um, other tasks that actually the technical support team carry out is the produ production of site notices. Now, um, since COVID, this process is slightly different. We do produce it on uh, waterproof paper, which is recyclable, which is much better than the laminated, it takes us less time to print them and is actually much better quality. Um, even so, we still have to uh, produce them. We post them out to our case officers so that they are able to put them up on site. Uh, last year, we did 2,847 site notices, and currently we have done 681 this year. Um, historic file requests, uh, it was another service that unfortunately had to stop due to COVID. Uh, we have brought this back in and we have been dealing with our um, previous requests that were received in COVID. Historic fire requests do take us a while because it is going through our paper or our microfiche um, documents and then obviously the whole file requires redacting and we have since um, late September been able to process over 64 file uh, historic file requests. Also last year we prepped for 39 different committees um, that was a mixture of City, South Cams and the JDCC. We also had some uh, specialised ones as well like the North Stowe one that uh, required us to uh, support. Um, redaction it seems a very simplistic task. It's, it's a really important service that we offer. Um, it's quite staggering to realise that actually 385 hours of my officer's time last year was spent doing redaction. That boils down to about just over 10 weeks of a full-time person actually doing reduction work. So it's a lot of time that goes unnoticed, but is massive, massively important. Um, we're also part of the decision process or decision notice process, I should say. So um, once a decision has been made, we make sure that notice is sent out and all the documents are loaded correctly uh, up into uh, public access. And again, last year, my team spent 826 hours dealing with decision notices. So a huge amount of time making sure they're correct and uh, go out correctly to everyone. Um, we also had 1,784 applications that had gone to press notice. So again, that's prepping it ready for um, our local newspaper and getting that out. It's done on a weekly basis, but it's just interesting to see the number of applications that um, went to press notice. Um, trees. Uh, last year, just as a number, 1,782 applications uh, were received by the councils. Um, it's currently a process that I'm working with uh, Jane is we're taking on the South Cam's tree process. So last year, um, my team weren't validating South Cam's tree applications. They were just doing city. But since um, the beginning of January, we have taken on South Cam's tree validation. Uh, we're moving on to taking on uh, the TSO, so tree, tree, tree preservation orders, um, and a couple of other bits that go along with that. But to give you some idea, um, City last year, we dealt or registered 52 of the tree preservation orders, and we had requests uh, for information um, of 137. Now, with the request for information, that doesn't just mean one tree, that could mean multiple trees, but they are just grouped together as a single request. So a lot of work uh, required again there. Land charges. Um, obviously, as agents, this doesn't have uh, quite so much of an impact on um, yourselves, but obviously it's part of my team um, and we deal with a lot of land charges. So just to help understand what we do within my team. Um, total number of land charges, payments that we took last year, uh, we took uh, 4,735 payments over the phone. Um, so yeah, every day we spend a couple of hours contacting our local search uh, companies and taking payments. 
Um, as you can see, huge amount of searches what we received. And again, a huge number returned um, and along with personal searches. Obviously last year was a huge year. Everyone will have been aware of the stamp duty holiday and the en masse of people moving. Um, with that in mind, that obviously had a massive, massive impact on land charges. Um, though numbers have dropped since uh, the stamp duty holiday in this region, there's still quite high. There's still a lot of movement within um, housing. Um, we managed to dispatch 7,725 searches in 2021, which was actually a 31% increase on 2020. As you can see, we're still doing quite a lot of searches. We're still producing quite a lot of work on that uh, for this year. It will be interesting to see how this year pans out and how the economy continues to recover in that sector. Um, compliments, just thought I'd share um, a few bits of feedback. So um, in 2021, uh, I only received five complaints about uh, the service that I delivered, but compliments, uh, I did thankfully receive uh, quite a few more, but I just thought I'd give a small flavour. So um, yeah, some of them are internal, some of them are external, but just thanking um, my team for the work that they have uh, achieved over that period of time. Uh, and finally, it was a very good year for us. Um, we were able to be either nominated or actually won some awards. Some of these are internal awards. So the GEM Awards is something that South County Council does that we are able to um, have people nominated for. So there's a range uh, there. Um, we also were able to win the Leadership uh, Award um, of the Unsung Hero uh, team. Um, so that was a massive, massive uh, thing for us, uh, just on the amount of work that we've done. Um, I was nominated for uh, the Cambridgeshire County Council's Apprenticeship Award, which is the first one they've ever run. And uh, very, very recently, we were a finalist for the Land Data Local Land Charges Awards. Um, so just a flavour of some of the stuff we do. I haven't obviously covered everything that my team does, um, but it is uh, just to hopefully emphasise the amount of work that is going on uh, within the technical support team. And I will stop sharing. Thanks very much, Charlene. Um, it was good to see the team win that award, <laughs> um, you know, the team of the year. So very well done. Uh, it's obviously a lot of work that you've um, had to go through. Uh, Helen Highwater, I think, comes to mind, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, any questions from anyone? Uh, Rob says, well done for the award. Thank you. It's appreciated. <laughs> Uh, a question from me, though, um, are the applications, number of applications coming in increasing? Since um, January, yes, I would say that the numbers have increased this steadily. Um, before Christmas, I was averaging probably about 130, 140. Um, oh. Since Christmas, I'm easily 160 plus um, per week. Uh, my highest so far this year and highest since I started the job was 245 applications submitted in one week. Um, the following week was 194. So we are having quite considerable peaks. Uh, oh. Last week was what I could class as slightly quiet at only 158. Um, so yeah, they they have been incredibly um, high and constant. So I've not had a lull, shall we say, to be able to catch up um, mm. anything. So yeah, appreciation by all agents for understanding just the huge volumes we've got coming in uh, and constant huge volumes coming in is very much appreciated. Wow. Yes, it just shows just um, how dynamic this area is and growing still, despite everything else. Thank you. Um, 
There might be questions later on, but in the meantime, can I hand over to Daniel to talk about the biodiversity SPD? Hi, Daniel. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Here we go. Ah, can hear you now. Ah, there we go. Right. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> right. Can you see me? Can anyone see me? Ah, there yes, I am. we can. We can see you and we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry, this, this is this is this is like home IT system of like having an old television over here with like different. <laughs> Things than my laptop over here. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit confused. But I haven't used I've used Zoom in a long, long time, so you have to forgive me. Um, I'm also going to try and share my screen as well, which may also get interesting. So just give me a second. Okay, uh, over to you. Right. So let's see which one. I think it should be that one. Okay. Can you see my presentation? One thing is that. Oh yes, we can see your whole screen now. All of it. Oh, that's even better. Let's let's stop doing that. I think you want to do this uh, uh, slide presentation. Uh, yeah. Hang on. I didn't even. Oh, good grief. I'm really sorry. Hang on. What is going on? I don't even know how to. Get, I'm really sorry. I don't know how to use Zoom. That is obviously what's happening. Um, if you click on the uh, at the bottom of the no, not that, not that. <laughs> uh, bottom of the slide on the right hand side where it shows the screen. I think it's that that's one. It. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that now? Yes. Brilliant. Sorry about this, everybody. <laughs> is that the end? <laughs> it is at the end, yeah. So it's, let's go all the way at the beginning. There we go. <laughs> oh, obviously a brilliant start by me. So thank you very much for bearing with me. I'm obviously a complete professional when it comes to these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, today I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about the biodiversity um, SPD, which we've recently brought out and been adopted by both councils. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire document. It's about 70 pages long, and there are lots of very good, interesting things. And I would, I would encourage all of you to to take a look at it and to provide and to encourage your clients, especially and their consultant colleges, to take a look at it as well. There's some really good stuff in there that you know we're really quite proud of. Um, so today, I'm, I'm just going to concentrate a little bit more on why we've done it, and then take sort of three of the sort of the headline issues, mainly um, by the way, make gain. Uh, bat and bird box provision and uh, great crested newt uh, district level licensing just as just to take out they're, they're probably the three things you're most likely to come across in in in, in your um, applications and just sort of tease out a little bit more about them um, where we are so first and foremost why have we changed what well, we come up with a new SPD or quite frankly the old SPD wasn't really fit for purpose any longer due to when it was published so the old SPD was published in 2009 um, which was well before lots of very integral bits of legislation and policy has been sort of formulated. Um, I think first and foremost, it came out before the original Conservation of Species and Habitat Regulations in 2010, which didn't help anybody. Um, that has since been updated many, many times and has now um, been written into UK statute and is outside of the European statute now as well. Um, I think one of the key changes was in 2012 when the um, National Planning Policy Framework came out. So in the 2012, what that did is it introduced the concept of no net loss to biodiversity. Um, so that meant that biodiversity suddenly became a planning issue, which I think was probably a, quite a key change. Um, I think the phrasing of no net loss personally was quite nebulous. It wasn't very quantitative. So it was really down to almost individual planning um, authorities to decide what that meant and how that was going to be um, pushed forward. So in sort of almost combination, I'm not sure whether it was designed that way, but in combination in 2012, the um, DEFRA and Natural England also started their um, biodiversity net gain pilot studies um, in seven mm -hmm. different authorities around the country. And they, since that sort of rolled on and rolled on and rolled on in 2018, we came to the new pub, um, uh, NPPF. And that brought into you know, the world of the concept of measurable biodiversity net gain. Now, again, that's gone through a couple of iterations, but you'll still find the term measurable biodiversity net gain in paragraph 174 and 179 of the document. So measurable biodiversity net gain is now a thing, and we do need to take it into account when looking at applications. Um, finally, and I'm sure you're all well aware of this one, is the Environment Act, which got um, royal assent back in November last year. Now, what the Environment Act is doing is it is bringing in mandatory 
biodiversity maintained. And by that, I mean that all applications subject to uh, town and country planning and also NSIP, so all of our national um, uh, infrastructure projects will be required to provide a minimum biodiversity net gain in all projects. So that is now being brought forward into law through mostly secondary legislation. So DEFRA at the moment are going through a public consultation. I believe the um, that is now closed in terms of um, submitting your comments, but they are now shifting through those comments and hopefully we'll be reporting at some point in the near future. Um, and that will probably frame how that secondary legislation comes through. Now, the intention is, is that the act itself will become enforceable in November of 2023 for all applications subject to uh, town and country planning. NSIPs at the moment are looking more towards 24, 25, but I have a feeling that that might come more into line with town and country planning post the, um, the consultation that's going on at the moment. Um, so what the Act does is it brings in that minimum requirement of 10% biodiversity net gain, and it's very, it emphasises that that is the minimum requirement. Mm. Um, other aspects of that particular um, Act, which I think are also really important at this point to recognise, is that applications that clear land prior to getting their baseline biodiversity um, uh, assessment completed will still be subject biodiversity net gain based on habitats previously on site. So any land that is cleared post January 30th, 2020, which was the date that the Act was put before Parliament, could be subject to biodiversity net gain even if the land has already been cleared. And it will be down to the, to the local authority really to determine what that will consist of. And we'll have to do that from aerial photography and we'll probably have to be quite cautious and, and call things you know, in good condition or excellent condition just to make sure we're covering it. So what I think the Act does is it shows that there's no, there's no gain in clearing land prior to getting your biodiversity um, baseline assessments done. So that those, I think those are the important things to take away from the Act as it is. Secondary legislation will come over the next two years and the mandatory um, requirement will set in in sort of November 2023. So that, that's where the Act is at the moment. Um, just sort of a couple of other brief things about biodiversity net gain. Again, what it does is it, it standardizes how it's measured. So all applications now must use the DEFRA metric. So at the moment we're at 3.0, which is obviously the third iteration of the, of the metric. They are already working on the next version of that metric. It, I think the plan is, according to myself and colleagues, talked to Nick White from uh, Natural England a few weeks ago, who's their lead on biodiversity net gain and his, uh, steer was that the, the next iteration will come out in, at the same time as mandatory biodiversity net gains comes in. So th this this is going to be a moving project. So this is going to keep on being updated as we go along, along with the small sites calculator. So remember, there are two um, metrics that can be used, one for small sites and one for, for the larger sites. Um, one of the important things we have to stress when you're looking at the metric itself is the metric is split into three different streams. One is area biodiversity. So this is your, your grasslands, your woodlands, things that have a, a boundary around the outside. Then there is linear biodiversity. So this is hedge lines, tree lines, things that have a, a length to them. And thirdly, and this is new to the new metric, is river habitat. So river habitat has been separated outside of the area habitat. Now, all three of those must provide 10% biodiversity net gain for the metric to be satisfied. So we can't have situations where they, you provide amazingly 35% biodiversity net gain in area biodiversity, which would be brilliant if you could, and you provide 13% net gain in linear, but you're, lose, you're only providing 4% gain in river, that won't satisfy the metric, and we have to make sure the metric is satisfied. So everything has to hit 10% plus broader for that metric to be satisfied, and that's when we'll agree to that metric, if you see what I mean. Now, if you have no river habitat, 10% gain of nothing is nothing, so that's fine. So it doesn't matter if, that, if you don't have that habitat in your, in your area, if you see what I mean. So it does work out. Um, so really, where does the, 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 the this SPD come in in terms of biodiversity gain? I think what we're, we try to do in terms of the structure is to provide almost like a process a way to sort of think about biodiversity within the process of designing your, 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 your applications. I think one of the things that we, we really want to sort of stress is that, to be honest, biodiversity net gain should now come in on day one of design or thoughts of 
of, of, of development. Personally, this is my own opinion, I, I think it should form part of your land purchase agreements. I think you should be doing those, those base assessments before you even buy, buy the land to understand what your obligation will be in terms of biodiversity units that will be provided. So it's your choice at this point in time whether or not those units are provided inside the red line. We would obviously prefer them to, but at some points they are, will be provided outside of that red line, which will mean you have to purchase credits and there will be a cost to that. So again, it goes into your viability. It can also impinge on your layout and your density. So all of these things are now going to be subject to what your biodiversity baseline is going to tell you. So it really should come in right at the very beginning of this process. Um, one of the things it does tell us is that the, the intention is in the local plan is to actually move further away from 10% net gain and move towards 20% net gain. Now, this is much more of a, of a, of a, of a Cambridge sheer wide sort of uh, scheme which is being put forward by lots and lots of different um, uh, NGOs and also Combined Authority and Natural Cambridgeshire and all the other sort of larger, larger bodies around us of, of really sort of pinning down and, and, and trying to sort of get back what we've lost. We've lost a lot of, of, of natural habitat from Cambridgeshire due to both development and also intensive based agriculture over the last, you know, 50, 100 years or so. So I think we, there is the feeling that Cambridgeshire has, has, has lost a lot more than other places and that we need to sort of try and gain that back. It also fits into other strategies that are coming forward at the moment, especially from South Cowns with their doubling nature strategy. So again, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on trying to push beyond 10% and towards 20%. And I think the, the local, the intention is for the local plan to back that up when that is, when that is adopted. Um, so, I mean, what I mean, Oh, sorry, one of the things I should say at this point is that we are at the moment putting together an interim guidance, uh, like hopefully a, little, a small technical document that we'll publish at some point in the next couple of months on what we will expect in terms of biodiversity gain from development in the period towards 2023. So we, we, we want to get as everybody in that process as early and as quickly as possible. We want to be able to provide that biodiversity gain from now on we really really do and we're going to try and provide that technical um, um, guidance in the next couple of months um, we have a document together it's, it's going through the process of review for uh, different levels of, of management at the moment so hopefully that will be with us at some point in the very near future um can we go um, through that quickly so that we can because we're running out of time now <laughs> okay no worries um i'll be very quick then <laughs> uh bat and bird box provision has um, increased since the last SPD, we're now looking at every dwelling to have a, a multi-use bird box and at least 25% of your dwellings to have bat boxes. We now have provision as well for commercial and industrial um, developments as well, which was missing from the, from the previous um, SPD. We have also formalized the requirement for hedgehog penetrability or hedgehog um, movement between all um, boundary, boundaries within the site. And lastly, uh, uh, great question new district level licensing hopefully some of you or, or most of you will have come across this already um, this is where you do not have to do any surveys you do not have to provide any mitigation within your projects but you do have to buy into the natural england scheme which is running in cambridgeshire if you choose to do that we must emphasize that you still need to provide us with your impact assessment and conservation payment certificate in uh, as evidence that you are part of that scheme prior to uh, determination of your application so you must meet you must have already apply to the scheme during your, before you apply to the, to the, your, your application, if you see what I mean. Um, I think that's probably everything. So thank you very much. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Daniel. There's a question here that says, is there an intention to follow London's example for measuring the urban greening factor? I'm not 100% sure what that is. I have to admit, sorry, I'm still trying, now trying to stop changing, um, sharing my screen um, and I have again I can't even find where my zoom screen has got to oh you're there okay hang on ah right you're there where is the it's in the chat there's a link in the chat um Zev, do you want to ask the question can you explain that very quickly a minute hi um I, it's it's less about maybe biodiversity as, as much as it's about uh, providing green roof and open area, which does let water and supports biodiversity. So in a way, in, in a dense urban environment where you don't have, it's, you know, maybe it's more related to city centers, um, to the city rather than South Camps, but in areas where there is 
um, um, less of a natural resource and less of uh, open ground, uh, you start measuring any surface as a potential green surface, which you can, can support um, uh, both water permeability and uh, biodiversity. So this, you start measuring the, the, the open surfaces and then you start applying some sort of a factor. And that's something that London's been doing, I think for the last couple of years. I don't know if, you know, with a you know, rapid urbanization of, 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 of Cambridge, whether it, you know, there is a way of starting thinking about maybe, you know, where, I don't know, I think Romsey, where you know, everything is, you know, very dense, very little open space. Um, we start applying some sort of thought about how we can make that area greener and supportive to the natural environment as well, rather than only, you know, the green belt, et cetera. It's, yeah. I'm happy to say, I'm happy to also help on this if it helps, Dan. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, it's something we've, we've been looking at through the green infrastructure evidence base that's come through for the local plan. So we haven't got a plan or a policy on it, but it's certainly conversations that we've started to have within the team with our policy colleagues. And um, it will be part of the next local plan, I think. But whether we'll actually go that far, I think we're just looking at the evidence base and how it would apply to Greater Cambridge at the moment. OK, thank you for that. Um, we kind of shot on time at the minute, but I think the next item was going to be for you to tell us something about some of the projects that you are up to so that we can understand <laughs> what you're doing, where you're at, you know. If anybody wants to share that with us, we're listening. Stephen, do you want to say anything on? Well, it was really, it was really just, a, uh, um, I, I think we do want to kind of potentially we've spent an hour and a half talking to you, um, recognize that, and there's a lot of information download. But I suppose i um, interested to get a bit of a feel for uh, uh, kind of issues that, um, and it, it, it arguably can fold into the Q&A, but issues that you're currently um, experience, things you're noticing. We, we're very aware of the acute interest in commercial space which is driving a huge number of approaches to us, for example, around uh, lab and um, commercial space at this moment in time. Um, but just any, any, any comments about what you see happening in the Cambridge or Greater Cambridge kind of um, planning realm um, uh, that uh, could be projects you're working on or demands you're facing, um, just to help us to get a bit of insight in terms of the pressures that you're, that you're experiencing. Thanks, Timmy. Anyone? <laughs> All very quiet. No, that's that that that's fine. We'll continue to guess what you're doing then. Um, that's <laughs> that's really fun. That's that's fine and helpful to me. Um, uh, so let's move to Q. &A. Okay. I, I just want to say something on the um um but I was still net gain. I mean, this is something else that the planning committee is uh, very keen on uh, these days. And um, of course, you know, we've got a lovely nature strategy as well. Um, and we'll definitely be looking um, for uh, new developments to, you know, at least meet the minimum, it's the minimum, but as um, uh, Daniel said, we're aiming for 20% um, in the emerging Greater Cambridge local plan. So just to let you know. <laughs> Um, Daniel, do you want to actually answer um, Phil Grant's question? Although I put a bit of a note in there. Um, are you considering um, biodiversity net gain offsetting at all to assist schemes that can't achieve it on site? Um, well, yeah, I mean, biodiversity offsetting is, is part of biodiversity net gain. Um, I think there are, there's a very real um, issue around much smaller sites that won't have that ability to have uh, biodiversity net gain within their red line boundary. Um, so I think you know the, there is a there is a, a, a very real issue when it comes to providing that offsite. Mm. Um, what we're trying to pin down at the moment is how that's provided offsite and where that's provided offsite. Um, I think the the national intention is that there will be huge markets of biodiversity net gain providers suddenly established in the next few weeks that will have millions and millions and millions of credits for everyone to buy that may well happen. There is also going to be a national scheme of biodiversity credit buying as well. So, you know, the provision offsite is going to be part of it. At the moment, we are trying to drill down on what that means to us in, in, in Greater Cambridge. Yeah. 
Thank you. Are there any questions that anyone else has before we bring this to a close? Um, just very briefly for, for, for Daniel, you just mentioned small sites. Um, for example, for renovations of existing buildings or you know small things like that, are you actually wanting biodiversity assessments? Where there's not a major change, say. I mean, if if if, if there's if if you haven't taken down a hedge or a grass, if you're just renovating a building, you're only working on 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 a building, and that there's no biodiversity involved, so you've not lost any biodiversity. So you only provide ten percent extra of the biodiversity you've lost. So if if you're working on a on a building that doesn't have any biodiversity, then you don't provide any biodiversity in the game. But say, say that you, uh, I don't know, extend an outbuilding by. Five percent or something like that, but that you are losing a square meter of garden area. Is is that something that really it, requires it, that? That is that is probably something that you should look towards in terms of the small site calculator. So there is there is a a, a, a separate algorithm that could work that out, and it will probably say that you're about three pound fifty in, in 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 units. I don't know. It, 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 that's there is there is a mechanism to look at that to see what that could be. Um, in reality, if you're taking out a meter grass and it's not exactly a highly diverse, highly important piece of habitat, so it's unlikely to, 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 to require too much work on it, if you see what I mean. So you know, there, are, there are scales of provision involved, depending on what it is that you are doing. So if, you're, if you're building a new house on scrubland, then you're going to have to provide oh. biodiversity uh, again. If you're simply renovating a building without extending the, the, the bounds of that building or only working on a driveway or a patio or something like that, then it's unlikely you're going to have to provide any biodiversity in that game. But you still have to say something about it. Is what well, yeah, I mean, you, all, all planning applications will be subject to it by law. So you will have to, you still will have to look into it and attribute what you believe is the, the answer to it, if you see what I mean. <laughs> so when does that come into effect? So it will be enforceable are by November 2023. So it, the, it will be brought forward, it is being brought forward by the, the Environment Act, which came through last year. And then the ins and outs, the specifics of 10% of, of biodiversity in the game will come through secondary legislation over the next 18 months. So are you actually saying that clients who want to put a path, a paved path in their garden would actually need planning permission? If it doesn't require planning permission, then it doesn't require biodiversity in the game. So if it's only if, if only it's only if things require by planning permission that they will require biodiversity in the game. So if they are subject to the subject to the Country Planning Act, then they will they will require to look to, to attribute whatever or to take it into account in their planning application. If it doesn't require planning application, planning permission, then it doesn't matter. Okay, so to go back to the absolute trivial. And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna have to. Okay. But you might have to take this offline if you don't mind, because um, it's now 10 o'clock, actually. <laughs> oh, right. But, you know, it, <clears throat> we, we can carry on if you want to stay. I'm just noticing that we're losing, we're already beginning to lose people. Um, there's one more question from Garth. Th thanks, Jimmy. I, I put it in the chat, so it, 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 it's, it was probably passed over, so don't worry. It was just a very quick one, and a question that I get asked all the time from clients. Pre-application pre inquiry is made, and say we sign the or we don't sign the commercial sensitivity box. What actually, where does it go in terms of consultation? That the question being a client said, if we put a pre-up, does it become public? And my default no. is well, always assume it, it may well be, but I don't think there's any um, default position where you consult local members, parish councils, whoever it is. No, that's fine. No. No, that's, that's fine, Julie. No, I can see Jane and Stephen nodding. So that was yeah. my understanding. That's fine. Thanks very much. OK, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's been hopefully a very useful uh, time for you all. Um, obviously, if there's any more, you know, that you would like to share, please let us know. Um, I don't know when the next meeting is going to be. I'm hoping to see you <laughs> after May, if that's um, <clears throat> depending on, <laughs> you know, various issues but um yeah it's been my pleasure um you know to be in this role and hopefully see you afterwards Stephen do you have anything you want to add 
I don't think so. Uh, but thank you very much, everyone, for your time today. I'm sorry it feels it might feel like we've we've talked at you a lot. Uh, we're very keen to uh, hear your feedback on what we can talk to you about. And indeed, uh, thanks to Jenny and Colin for their comments about what's going on. I suppose actually it might be quite interesting um, in a future meeting to get a, a bit of a presentation from uh, someone who might volunteer to give us that kind of an overview, because I think the issues that we collectively face um, around what is hot in Greater Cambridge uh, come to, I'm sure you as agents, uh, our understanding is really uh, uh, enhanced by what, uh, what you're telling us uh, and how we can, we can hear that. Uh, and, um, and I'm sure people would just be interested uh, on, uh, on what a great place it is that we're working uh, uh, for all of us. Uh, and um, some of the challenges, nevertheless, that we will need to collectively engage with. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for your time today. And thanks especially to my team uh, as well, who all got up early uh, to talk to you uh, today. So thank you. Yeah, and especially Bev. Thank you. You're welcome, everyone. Yes, thank you. Absolutely, <laughs> Bev. Thanks, Bev. Bye, everyone. Thank you, bye. Thanks, all. Thanks, bye.